I'll just let our Facebook group guys know. Hi, it's Katrina from Slange. Um, and we are here this evening to talk about the declaration of our growth. So I went and just put my hair back because it was a wee bit of a riot earlier. Um, I just wanted to, first of all, start off by saying thank you. Hi, Donna. Uh, thank you to everyone who um, has been kind of joining in all this time. It's been really nice to have you come into my home and for me to come into yours. Um, and um, I thought this is an occasion to dress up. So I have actually bothered today, unlike others. So I'm wearing my declaration of our growth t-shirt, if you can see that. And I am drinking from my declaration of our growth cup. If you can see that, it is my wee cup. Um, I have a declaration of our growth um, picture on my wall as well in my hallway. Um, I sadly, I can't go and bring it up to you all. But hi, everybody. Hi, everybody who's joining. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, so today um, has been a really kind of bittersweet day for a lot of people like myself who are very much involved in Scottish history. And uh, we were talking away back in January about celebrating this really, really, really important anniversary um, of uh, the declaration of our growth. It's the 700th uh, anniversary of it being signed back in 1320. Hi, Ursula. Um, and so I thought, and hi, Andy. Um, sorry, many kilt tours has just joined and I love you. And I've been watching all your posts. Um, if anyone's looking, uh, Andy at Mini Kilt Tours is, is awesome as well. Um, all as girls in our mini kilts, but anyway. Um, so I thought um, I would chat a wee bit about the significance of the declaration of our growth, what it means for Scotland, um, what it meant for Scotland then, and what it meant for Scotland, or what it rather means for Scotland now, because it seems rather odd that we're still going on about a 700 year old. Uh, document. Um, so uh, just to start, uh, get things out of the way. Hi Ursula, I think I said that. Um, we wanted to kind of go into my own politics because you have to in this game and for this particular reason because everything is always tied together. Uh, so hi Stuart, a happy birthday um, from a Scottish perspective, from somebody living in Scotland now, I am what you would call a Scottish nationalist. So I believe in freedom for Scotland and that basically means independence for Scotland. So um, I was born into a family who strongly believes in Scottish independence um, with uh, my grandfather and others having been very, very, very uh, crucial to setting up movements in my local area. So my grandfather helped set up the Scottish National Party in my area. And as such, I have been involved in the movement since I was born. <laughs> Although I should say being in Scotland we all like our um, viewpoints challenged and because at the time until quite recently it was quite an unpopular viewpoint uh, when it started only about five percent of the population had any sensibility um, or any kind of inkling or affiliation uh, with Scottish independence. So um, it's come on leaps and bounds since it started. Um, way back, well, initially in the 1930s, the real Scottish National Party and the independence movement in the 20th century kicked off. Now, um, 
the declaration of our growth is one that people within the movement, you know, we like to look at, talk about. When I was a young girl, we would go to um, our broth. Um, my grandfather took us over and it wasn't just to go and see the Arbroath Smokies and see the beach. <laughs> it was, or, you know, this magnificent ruined Scottish Abbey. It was about the significance of the declaration itself. Um, so that's, uh, that's why we were, we were involved at such a young age. Um, so I've, spent most of today actually writing a little blog so I'm just gonna read it to you just because you know it's a bit of fun um and hopefully you can get a sense of of what I'm banging on about and then um we can open the floor to questions and answers so let's start so I like I've titled this David against Goliath okay so we're going to get started. So on this monumental anniversary in Scotland's history, I look at why was the declaration of our growth so significant and why does it still hold so much meaning 700 years later to the people of Scotland? Firstly, like I said, cut me open and I would quite literally bleed tartan. Scotland is in my veins, it is in my soul, and it makes up my whole being. To me, it is being part of something much bigger than myself, and of which something I would sacrifice all. Now, I'm sure you are thinking, oh no, not another tartan Nazi. But that couldn't be farther from the truth. To me and others, my love for Scotland is not about nationalism, but more about symbolism, social justice, and a collective of people who have so much more to be proud of. So much so, we have a tendency to give ourselves a hard time for our failures and our ill deeds, and quite rightly so. In fact, we have a tendency to celebrate our defeats just as much as we do our victories. You just have to look at Culloden and Bannockburn. This is in stark contrast to British and English nationalism, which glorify, glorifies only the good and ignores the bad. And it can be argued that uh, rewritten altogether to make something that was bad look quite good. Now, what was the declaration of our growth exactly? The declaration of our growth was a letter from the barons and people of Scotland to the Pope. Their purpose was to appeal to him to change his view on the long running English Scottish conflict. It was filled with very emotive and evocative language which spoke of freedom and English occupation and tyranny. The most famous excerpt being, as long, which is what's on my t-shirt guys, as long as but a hundred of us remain alive, never will we on any conditions be brought under English rule. It isn't truth, not for glory, nor riches, sorry, I can't say it, nor, nor riches, nor honours that we are fighting, but for freedom, for that alone, which no honest man gives up, but with life itself. So this was a significant plea, which was led by the heretic Bruce. And even so, the church had decided to finally accept Scotland's cries for help. This was aided by the fact the letter was signed in one of our most important abbeys at our growth and with the blessing of the Scottish clergy of the day. Most importantly, and this is the most significant part, guys, the nobles who signed it were holding the Scottish king to ransom in that he must adhere to the interests of the people of Scotland. If not, he would be replaced. Now, Bruce often gets a lot of flack for being a crazed megalomaniac, but ultimately he was the first to really accept the people of Scotland um, or really accept that the people of Scotland were sovereign and that he in fact served them. And this is all taken in a 14th century kind of context kind of way um, because equality still had a long time to go and by all means, and we're probably still not even there today. But nevertheless, this was a, such a powerful 
play and a mandate that not only did it help cement Scotland's place as a recognised independent nation in all of Christendom, but it was modelled by other nations looking to secure their independence. It was even used to write the United States of America's very own Declaration of Independence. Now, I just think, is that not incredible? How an insignificant wee country like Scotland can make such a stamp on the Catholic Church and the rest of Europe? And as a big and powerful country like England to have to accept the will of God, essentially the Pope defined the will of God. So that is what Scotland is. And to every Scot who has fought against all odds for the sake of their freedom, their rights and their convictions. Throughout Scottish history, without that document, I do believe that we may have a starkly different culture. We probably wouldn't have had the Reformation, which although some may see as a blight, gave everyday people access to God, gave them power to read the scripture themselves, and most importantly, think for themselves, at least initially. This can be seen further down the line through the Enlightenment, the Jacobite Risings, the 1820s Risings, and even more recent social justice and labour movements. They were all sparked in Scotland and spread to every corner of the globe. Now, admittedly, we were not always as lucky as we were in the 14th century in gaining the Pope's blessing. Since then, we have lost so much by being colonised and, and indoctrinated by the English elite who control Westminster to this very day. It's been an unpopular, um, it had, well, it's been deemed unpopular to want freedom. It seems awfully unnatural to many in Scotland and British people who cannot understand people in Scotland would want to be democratically free from the shackles of Westminster. Our identity has been slowly chipped away from our languages to what we see in the media and our Scottish history and traditions. You could say that this, that it has all been taken, cleansed and sold back to us for the price of the oil they found in the North Sea. Now I'm painting a rather depressing picture, but it's because of the above that my heart absolutely bursts for, with pride for those who didn't sit quietly those who, in some cases, martyred themselves. And guys, I, I refer to that because I will be doing a piece on the 1820s martyrs on Wednesday on the anniversary of the storming of the Greenock prison here. We then also have people like my own grandfather who faced the vile vitriol his entire adult life for his desire for democracy. To the people who are no longer with us in more recent years, but without whom we wouldn't have what I really am proud of, the Yes Movement as it stands. They did the groundwork and I thank them for it. I also speak for folk like Kay Matheson, Wee Jim Riddle, Big Tam and so many more, thank you. So to me, the significance of the declaration of our growth 700 years later is that it's basically the might of David against Goliath, that against a giant where it's always so easy to feel powerless and submit. We the Scots instead realizing that we hold all the power through our dedication to do and believe what's right for our countrymen and women, for our future and for that of others. And at some point, some point, we're gonna have our own declaration of our growth moments and someone is going to listen and I'm looking at you Europe, wherever you are. So to all those out there who are like myself, keep the faith book or, and uh, that's my bit, that's my political broadcast that I'm going to end for the day. <laughs> but uh, I thought that it would be quite nice um, and to post some information about it. So I'm just going to quickly see quickly. Um, yeah, today is also the 101st anniversary of the Easter Rising in Ireland, which obviously ultimately led to Irish independence as well. Um, so that's all good. Let's just see, we've got quite a few people. And hello, we've got the New York Caledonia Society joining in. And Kyle, thanks for joining. Um, I'm so sad that we weren't um, able to have the Tartan Week in New York City this year but we will be back and I've been 
watching um the feed the facebook feed and and the instagram um very closely to see uh people celebrating scottishness nonetheless with everything and i just think it's it's quite good that it's on a day that we mark such a momentous anniversary in terms of the declaration of our growth so without further ado because my political broadcast has now ended um what uh have we got any questions about any of it and well i uh, i should also say folks i am also half english so <laughs> There we go. So it's just a bit, it's always like this, a bit of a delay. Hi everyone that's joining. Nice to see you. Hi Chaz. Not Christopher Watt. What I'm gonna do is actually post this um, article. You will be able to view it at some point um, because I have been um, busy with it. Um, I wrote that today and I thought it would be a nice little piece of patriotism to mark such a monumental um, anniversary, um, but also just the kind of sentiment of what that means to Scot well, to a lot of Scottish people today and, um, and that we've always been a slightly more egalitarian um, people you know, with the social justice movements and things like that. And I honestly believe that it comes from the declaration of our growth. It's always about being the little guy, knowing what you're doing is right, going against all social norms, all the kind of, I mean, it's so much easier to, to roll over. It's so much easier to say, yes, that's fine. I'll just, let's leave the status quo. And as Tom said, people in Ireland rose up and, and they got their independence, but um, there you go. Hi, Jackie. Um, hi, Jane. Oh, my lovely Jane, I love you. Uh, Jane Ireland, I'll just put a wee shout out once this corona is all down and gone. Um, Jane and her son run one of the nicest um, little uh, bar and restaurants um, near Loch Lomond called Slange, again, like our name, um, and just the nicest and best people on this planet. Um, the place actually used to sit, um, it's an old church, and it was, uh, it became the clan centre for the clan McFarland. So if you're interested in anything to do with McFarland, you go to Slange in Tarbert. Um, hi Jackie and it's great seeing you actually I've been jealous looking at all your Alaska pictures and your bald eagles and it just looks absolutely magic um, so I hope you're staying safe. Hi Des. Um, we've got Alex. Alex I love you. I needed a wee English one person to come in. Um, so your, Alex has asked if Scotland got the independence before why now are you still not independent? So that's a very good question. <laughs> um, so Scotland has been a country, has been a nation, uh, an independent recognised nation since 843 AD. So a very, 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 very long time. And um, obviously from about the time, well, it was just after the death um, of Alexander III that uh, we were left without a monarch. So it put Scotland into um, basically a potential um, onset of a civil war to determine who was going to be our next king. Because obviously Alexander III's granddaughter, Margaret, uh, died on their way back to Scotland. So um, we had no monarch. So Scotland asked our nearest neighbour for help in selecting um, a uh, a monarch, a new ruler, um, and they asked none other than Mr. Edward Longshanks, Edward the First himself, um, who was very busy in a European context of an expansion 
Um, he was, you know, you know, when you're building an, a, a, an extension to your home and your conservatory, well, Edward the, the first of England was doing that in terms of countries he was going to, to take in and to invade and conquer. Um, and he was doing that in Ireland, in Wales, in Cornwall and in France. Um, and he set his sights on Scotland. So what he did is he elected a guy called um, John Balliol, who's known as the Puppet King. And he basically sent in English forces and occupied Scotland during that time. Um, so that was a big, a big issue for a lot of Scots and they rose up and um, it was when John Balliol kind of said, finally, this is enough. Um, they had um, the siege at Berwick, uh, which was probably the most grotesque things to have ever happened in, in Scotland, whereby Edward I himself was there and he, well, he um, killed everybody inside, uh, had his army just brutally murder everybody inside. Um, and apparently he only called off the battle or the, the siege, whatever you want to call it, the violence, um, when he saw one of his soldiers hacking to death a woman as she was actually in the process of giving birth. So that was that was one of the stories. Um, lovely, lovely, happy story. Um, but that then inspired people like Wallace and others, uh, Andrew de Mori, who ne we never really talk about, um, to rise up. Um, against uh, Edward um, and he became a bit of a thorn in the side of Edward the first and after the Battle of Stirling Bridge and his um, endeavours across the border in England um, Edward sought to have him removed and eventually he was captured I'm talking about Wallace here and he was hung drawn and quartered uh, in London and his body parts dispersed all over Scotland as a warning to say, no, you're not going to do that, you Scots. But that didn't really work because then we have a guy like Bruce and John Common as well. John Common, um, nobody ever really talks about him, but John Common um, had one of the, probably the most significant victories over any English army ever in history. And that was the Battle of Roslyn, where you're talking about around 30,000 Englishmen were slaughtered, were slaughtered um, in 1303 um, on, on a battle that had basically three fronts. It's, it's a very fascinating time. And then obviously he has a bit of a problem with Bruce and uh, he ends up dead in a church down in um, Greyfriars in Dumfries. Um, so that was uh, that was a major no no from the sense of the uh, the Catholic Church or the hierarchy, the kind of top of the Catholic Church, the popes, popes. I have to say because there were two at the time, um, and uh, so that, that was a massive uh, problem for the um, the Scots and for Bruce's campaign because he was having all these victories. But unfortunately, um, he wasn't getting the the message wasn't going through. You know, we've had Bannockburn, so thirteen fourteen we have Bannockburn, um, and others. Um, and the, in thirteen twenty, this is when the Declaration of Arbroath is finally signed. So this is six years after Bannockburn. So that's Edward the second. So by this point, Edward the first has actually died. Um, and his son, Edward II, is now uh, King of England. And he continues his father's campaign in Scotland and tries to crush, crush the Scots. Good, good use of the English language. Hi, guys. Thanks for joining. Um, and Erin, nice to see you. And Barbie Girl. Um, so, yeah. So basically, I'm just giving you a wee history lesson here. So that goes into um, the fact is that because Bruce has essentially, and I'm going to put in verse comments because I don't, the language is really important when explaining history. And I'm not going to go as far as to say that Bruce murdered John Common. I'm just not going to do that. I'm not going to take 14th century um, chronicles 
in particular, English chronicles as fact in any sort of coherent murder investigation, okay? Uh, what I will say is that um, Common does end up dead and this happens in a church. So from the perspective of the church uh, and the church as an organization, any death by violence in a church setting is a big no-no. It's supposed to be a place of God. It's supposed to be God's house. It's supposed to be a place of truce, a place of, um, uh, what's the word? Guys, help me out here. I said it earlier. A holy place. A holy place. No, not a holy place. Um, a sanctuary. That's the word I'm trying to think. <laughs> a place of sanctuary. So, um, Bruce was kind of shunned for that. He was seen as a heretic for what he did. And the English really bigged that up um, to the kind of powers, the, the church establishment of the day. So um, from the Scottish clergy, though, um, Bruce had, uh, you know, the Scottish clergy were kind of on side, um, some of them even going to war. Um, but that's why a broth was so significant and why it had to be done there because it's by whereby all the barons and the people of Scotland, I also do that like that because it's only the kind of nobility um, and uh, people with any land who are in a position um, to make any sort of signature on that document. Um, but it was done at Arbroath Abbey. So it was done in the place of God, in the house of God, uh, one of the most important houses of God in a Scottish context. And uh, then it was sent to Rome and therefore they or say Rome, it was actually France. Um, but it was then, it had to be then accepted and it kind of um, cemented Scotland's independence. Um, Scotland had never essentially lost its independence. It was just trying to maintain its independence. Now, to what Alex had asked before is why is Scotland still not independent now? Well, um, a long story, and it comes from probably, I would say, easily. I mean, Scotland and England have been warring with each other for a long time, a um, long time after Bruce, actually, and after the declaration was signed. Um, but it wasn't until 1603 when James VI of Scotland becomes James I of England, so he unites both kingdoms. Now, I can't say that the goal was always to be one political state, and let's get rid of those pes pesky Scots, but, um, and I can say that his descendants were not so uh, much for the notion of a united kingdom of Great Britain, as we now know, a political union, the dissolvement of Scottish independence and essentially English independence as well, um, to become Britain, the, the nation of Britain. Um, that was signed away eventually in 1707. Um, it's, it's one for another day, to be fair. Um, it was down to a lot of, uh, well, there was a lot of bully tactics in going on. You have in 1705, you've got what's known as the Alien Act, which in England they declared any Scottish person would be considered an alien if discovered because Scotland was still trading with their enemy France. Um, there was, let me think, there was obviously um, the, usurp, the usurper of William of Orange and his uh, wife Mary, who took the throne from a Scottish Stuart monarch, essentially, James VII. Um, and that started to change the mentality. We started to see more English politics play in Scotland. And I mentioned briefly about that on our Glencoe section the other night and also our Jacobite section. Um, and then you see the conditions of the Act of Union in 1707. Eventually they got it to a place which was deemed acceptable to some of the powers that be, such as um, the church, the Kirk 
Initially, the Kirk, um, the Church of Scotland, was not behind the idea of uniting with England. Um, it was uh, only after the um, English, I have to say, because that's where the, the document comes from, made a proclamation, if you like, within it that Scotland would always have the the Kirk as their main church of state. So that managed to get them on side. Only 1% of the people of Scotland at that time roughly did have the right to vote. So when it did vote, it was in fact very close. Um, and there was um, a threat of English invasion if they said no. And they had not long had the um, first Jacobite war um, in the uh, 16, late 1680s. So this is a really important um, time in Scotland. And basically, we signed our independence away. Um, I could go. I could go into it so much. Um, it's uh, it's a really interested uh, and interest. It's a really interesting topic and one that I think a lot of people don't really know much about um, because they Scottish history is not properly taught. And if it is, it's kind of watered down to such a degree that it's hard to really form an opinion either way. Um, so that's really important um, from a from a Scottish uh, perspective, and why it's it's not so mainstream, or you don't see it uh, as much. Sorry, I'm just reading some of the comments here. We've got <laughs> some people are quoting Robert Burns. Um, so you, a declared admirer of William Wallace. <laughs> Aren't we all? Actually, honey, you've got the, the Wallace tree there. We actually have a piece of William oh. Wallace's tree. You've yeah, got yeah. it. We've got a piece of the Wallace tree that they chopped down. The Wallace project. Look at that. That's This is how far we go. <laughs> this is Helmet who got this from a friend, another patriot. Um, and this is um, from the Wallace tree. I know I'm kind of going off our broth here a wee bit, but it, it's through the same vein. Uh, Sir William Wallace, after his capture at Robroyston near Glasgow on the 3rd of August 1305, was taken to Dumbarton Castle and held overnight. The next morning he was taken across the River Clyde to an area now known as Port Glasgow, where according to local legend he was chained to an oak tree by his captors before being handed over to English troops for his transfer to London and his judicial murder. <laughs> I love the language here because it's so true. His, judici his judicial murder. murder. God, Catriona, it's getting late. This oak tree survived until 1995 when in what is now the, gro the grounds of the Holy Family Church, it eventually fell during a winter storm. The Society of William Wallace, supported by leading... Oh, I can't read without my glasses on. Yeah, let's just say by Dr. Coralie Mills verifies that the piece of wood in this package is from the legendary Wallace Oak in Port Glasgow. So it might not, the legend itself might not be true. And who wants to see a piece of the Wallace Oak? Wallace is said to have touched this. Well, against his will, right enough, he was chained to it. But here is the piece of tree. Tell them to support their cause because they're using the money for all sorts of um, yeah. traditional investigations and stuff. Like so here you can it buy is. Buy a Wallace piece for ten quid. So you can buy a piece of this Wallace tree. I feel like um, I feel like um, like a medieval um, a religious relic salesman here, but it's it's you know authenticated to some degree. Um, so this is a piece of the tree that was in fact in Port Glasgow where the legend comes from. If you can just see it there, okay. And um, you can purchase a piece of Wallace's tree from um, their website. I think it cost 10 pounds. Was that right, Helmet, 10 pounds? Yeah. yeah, so it wasn't a lot of money. Um, 
for to support because they do a lot of research and things. They're a really good uh, bunch to to support. Hold on, let me just see um, if they have uh, a website at all. If you just go, that's the Society of William Wallace. Okay, so I think my my grand is a wee member of that as well. <laughs> And there we go. Let me just see if we have any other questions. Sorry, I hope I answered your question there, Alex. Anyway, I, I know I kind of ramble on a little bit, but um, so um, hi, Crystal. Nice to see you. Put your glasses on, then, Hen. <laughs> Where are they? Where are they? Um. So let's see. Uh, it is quite sad that that the history is not properly taught in our schools. I have to say it's not the best. Um, sorry, Lenny has come in. Scotland did sign their independence away, but with the proverbial gun to our head. Yes, that's what I was trying to get at before with the kind of army um, threatening at the Scottish border. Um, so that was a that was a big uh, reason for it, but I suppose that's why um, a lot of people have kept kept the fire alive. Um, and I will be making a wee um, talk, a uh, little the same a wee live video on Wednesday, and I hope you all join in for that because it's a lesser known part of our history as well. It's the anniversary of. Another massive anniversary, guys. It was 1820. 1820. On the 8th of April, 1820, um, we had our own little Bastille Day here in Greenock with the 1820s martyrs. So um, it's a really significant anniversary for that as well. So we've got all these massive big anniversaries happening uh, while we're all in social confinement. Um, social confinement, yeah, we're all stuck inside. Um, so hopefully, um, you know, you tune in and learn something and maybe we'll get someone to play the pipes or something like that. <laughs> Just to, you know, I've got Stuart McMillan off and goes and plays the pipes, but is down in, in Greenock for the anniversary for that. Um, and I know that there's a lot happening live at the moment. If you go on to Facebook and other places, there's musicians playing things like that um, for the declaration. So have we got any other questions? Because we've still got a good 20 minutes, guys. Um, for such a significant date in history. Um, to save me rolling on, though, has anyone got anything you'd like to add with my declaration of our broth cup? I really put out all the stops, guys. I'm wearing lipstick, I put my makeup on. I put my shirt on. I've put um, my tea, my teacup, which is actually full of gin. <laughs> I shouldn't tell you that. And I'm wearing my slange kilt. So I don't know if you could see that. The slange kilt, and I'm doing that really for um, the guys at Tartan Week because I know that um, it's. Uh, it's something that you're trying to encourage people to get their Scottish on. And I hope you guys are all a wee bit Scottish as well today um, and celebrating this monumental Scottish day. Uh, let's just see. Is the declaration... Ah! Obviously, because it's about Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> Is the declaration... I'll just read this out for our Instagrammers. Is the declaration of our growth more important than the Magna Carta? Um, and I have to say, the answer, in my opinion, is yes. Um, and the reason for that is kind of like I was saying in my my um, article that I wrote. This is a David and Goliath situation. This is like a small little country um, against a giant who was uh, imposing their will and their um their uh any sense of um rebelling against someone who is um 
taking your liberty away needs to that's just a massive thing especially when you're such a small part especially when your king has murdered somebody in a church <laughs> and especially to get the rest of Christendom to actually acknowledge what you're doing Magna Carta is important in an English sense and I'm not going to deny it but from a Scottish sense I think we'll fight we'll probably learn more about the Magna Carta than we will on anything Scottish um, and I think that from an English perspective and I think uh, and I do apologize to any of the English people listening because it's not meant in an anti-English kind of way but it's just the nature of what happens when a larger a larger partner uh, is, is sharing your uh, laws and your media and everything else the larger party is always going to have more prominence than the little ones so the likes in Northern Ireland I mean I have to say I know almost nothing about Northern Ireland from a, like a general sort of sense. I have absolutely no idea about the geography. I have no idea really about much of the history other than the history that has something to do with Scotland um, or maybe a bit more recent history. Um, and the same goes for Wales. I have absolutely no real idea of Welsh history. I only really know Scottish history that I have had to learn myself or else I would be very Anglo or British centric so most of the history is from the Union or it is um, from an English perspective Elizabeth the first you've got even even calling all of our monarchs with uh, like British monarchs, key word there, all of our British monarchs have got English titles just so that it makes sense to the English folk. I find that really, really, really offensive to everybody else in the United Kingdom who has got nothing to do with um, <laughs> just, you know, we're just going to say Elizabeth II because, you know, so what? Now there's argue, there's no argument for it, to be fair. People try to make arguments and rules and whatever. You just don't do it. Don't disrespect somebody else's history. Just don't do it. And that's really the problem is when your whole identity has been completely washed away and rebuilt to something that is, that is manageable by the establishment it be. And that's really my issue with it. So I like that always a wee bit Scottish, especially on a day as monumental as today. That's night every day a bit Scottish cat. Uh, you hired a kilt from Slange Kilts in Edinburgh last year. That's nice. Uh, <laughs> they're not the same company as us. We just like that word because it means health in Gaelic. So um, there you go. Um, the declaration of our growth is not spoke about. English like to think they are more superior than anyone else. Um, I'm going to be controversial and actually say I don't necessarily agree with that, Alex. I think that the elites um, are always the same people and they like to um, inspire people en masse. So if, if I am um, looking at explaining something historical and, and it's going to make me money or informative to the majority of the people, I'm going to do that to the majority of the people. Scotland makes up 8% of the Scottish, uh, of the uh, British population. It's crazy how little, little we are. England um, is, is, well, what's England? We're about, pff, more than 10%, it's like 12% or something larger than we are. It's, it's massive. Um, the difference. So I wouldn't say that there's a superiority there. It's a, it's just from what you know and what you're told, and what you're told is said to you to keep you on site and all the rest of it. But there we can go. Um, Three hundred years of cultural genocide, which isn't widely accepted even by Scots. Um. I was mentioning this chap before because he is, like I told you, like one of my favorite human beings. And that is uh, Professor Murray Pittock. And he does a really great talk. 
um, you can find it. I think I found it on Vimeo. Um, and it's about British identity. What is Britain? What is it? What is the British uh, national identity? Is it a myth? So um, he puts a really good argument together that ultimately what happened was um, in the 19th century, at the beginning of the 19th century, so when we have like George IV, when he comes to Scotland and for like, he was the first monarch to come to Scotland in 200 years, right? Um, he, hold on, have I got that right? I think so. Sorry, if I've got that wrong, let me know. <laughs> I'm like just throwing out a number there. I think I'm right. But it seems quite large. So um, the problem with George IV is that when he came to Scotland, he famously wore this really ridiculous kilt and this weird kind of, apparently ha he had like a badger sporing on and he just looked a bit of an idiot. Um, and him and his court basically said, you know, we want every single noble family in Scotland, like head of the family, um, to get their own tartan and stuff like that. So we've got, everybody's like, oh, I've got like a whatever tartan. It doesn't mean anything. It, it means from a 19th century construct. You probably, I'll go into tartans another day, actually, because it's one of my biggest bugbears, because it's what I like to call tartan tat or um, shortbread tin Scotland where you have taken something, an element to make people feel that they have a place and that they are being celebrated, but only as much as you want. So everything becomes a bit fluffy. Everything becomes all very twee is the word. So you wear kilts and you've got the bagpipes and you've got all these things which um, are very much Scottish, but were um, not um, okay. Um, according to the British establishment before um, the 19th century. And it's this kind of sense of expansionism in the British Empire where they're going to all corners of the globe, uh, India, Africa, uh, Australia, all these different places, Canada. And what they're attempting to do is to get the Scots on side and to be proud to serve the queen's, the queen and country, Victoria and her country, uh, in their new exploits. So that's why we have all the regiments. They're very proud to be of that particular regiment. But uh, sadly, a lot of it was only under the guise of empire. Um, so you have this kind of sense of Scottishness that starts to appear, and they do that to keep the Scots on site. Because remember, I'm gonna be talking about this on Wednesday, the, um, the 1820s martyrs, what, what happens in Scotland and subsequent risings thereafter. Um, it's not really until the 20th century that Scotland really disappears. And so does England really, or maybe England comes into play and, be, and totally replaces Britain. Britain therefore becomes England. And uh, one of my other favorite people, I forget his bloody name right now, while I'm sitting here, another is actually a lecturer at St. Andrews University. And he said, think about this for a moment, guys. Think about this one thing. How many well-known, popular pieces of writing or literature are set in Scotland? okay by an english author essentially by an english author think about that how many the answer guys is none bar apparently a little bit i forget the name of the, the book but um uh uh, what was it? Um, Virginia Woolf, she set a story in Sky, but uh, if you read it, it could have been in anywhere, anywhere in England, in a little chocolate box village that's set on Sky. Um, the other, only other Scottish um, piece of literature that comes from England is something called Macbeth by Shakespeare, 
where um, the sense is to be anglicized and um, less barbarized. Um, so they change the word thane, which is a good Scottish word for an earl. So the thanes become earls. And this is because they're trying to show that the new Scottish king is going to be very English. And it was a very popular idea that we're not going to be taken over by these Scots. Um, they will be uh, assimilating into the proper English civilized culture. Um, the reason why I mentioned that is because if you turn that question that I gave you on its head, how many Scottish authors have written books, literature that is set in England? And I can just go, I mean, let's start off. We've got Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes. Um, we It's set in London. We have got J.M. Barry, um, Peter Pan set in London. So there are so many pieces of literature which are not uh, set in Scotland. And it was because they were trying to assimilate this idea of Britain and Scotland to be popular and to be successful. You need to take away what makes you Scottish. And that was never emulated the other way. So that's uh, that's just me on my soapbox again. But it's a really interesting um concept and it's something that the moment you start thinking about it it does start to raise uh, questions like why is that it's not necessarily because scottish people or english people want to be bad to scottish people i don't believe that for a second um i think that the elite always like to control as much as they can and they don't have the full empire and i do think that scotland and the other smaller nations uh, within the united kingdom are the last bastions of empire um but uh yeah it's uh it, it's more about who controls you so i just want to read what tom's saying when the crown forces were trampling over the irish and scots it wasn't really the ordinary englishman who was doing it but political forces from the ruling elite the ordinary englishman or woman was just as much cast down in a lot of ways i believe and i totally agree with that 100 percent um, a lot of people don't. Um, I think a lot of people, and I mean, I was part of some ridiculous post the other day in this history group, uh, Tom, that I found you on. And it was about William Wallace. And I can't remember what it was. I think someone said that they were somehow related to Wallace. Um, but it started this really anti-English sort of bile, which started to come from people. Um, which is really sad to see because they had no idea what they were talking about. They were using justification for their hatred and their their um, racism um, because of Braveheart. So uh, I find that's not the best way to look at things. The English, the average English person, was in no way. Um, no way better than than somebody else uh, and i think that's a great idea i just like it dark because i think it's better on my face because <laughs> then i don't have to show it off to you um as much and i can look better than what i actually do um let me just see so we've got and despite all that in spite our national tendencies we would just like to wish boris johnson well and make sure he makes a full recovery I would like to reiterate that we've got very political tonight, um, but I think it's important to say that um, the head of uh, the British government at the moment and a party that we usually um, are very much against, the, the Conservatives, um, Boris Johnson has just been sent to intensive care um, with the coronavirus and um, we would like just to wish him well and to make a full recovery because it's not nice and um, no matter what your political persuasions you shouldn't um, that shouldn't overtake your your um, position on normal human decency and goodwill for others even if they hold a different opinion to yourself uh, so yeah, I think I know he's I don't know if he's on a ventilator. I, I literally saw it not long before I came live, so I didn't really read all of the um 
the information on it, all that all I saw was the headline that he was moved to ICU, which is intensive care. Um, so yeah, I, I I very much hope so too. Especially he's got his um his partner has also tested positive, and she's as we all know pregnant, and it's a, it's a real horrible thing to to have to go through. While we're on the note the note of Corona, actually, I just wanted to just send out. Uh, my love to one of um, my customers who's in the States, but she's originally from Italy. Sadly, she has lost um, three members of her family in just a week. Um, it's a serious, guys, and as much as we are all trying to stay positive, it is important that we all, you know, keep to the the, the medical advice. Look after yourself. Stay at home. Please stay at home. I'm doing all these videos from my home. Just and and as Anne says, and it's dark and it's may may look a bit dingy, but um, I'm doing that to promote safety and just give you guys a little bit of something nice to look forward to and to chat about from a Scottish context um, and just to look at my big face. Uh, but there you go. So I'd just like to send all my condolences to. Um, to your family, uh, you know who you are, and much love, and hopefully um, this passes soon. Um, so you're very welcome. Yes, we're just uh, not long. We're just finishing. I'm just reading some of this chat. Um, People are the same, Alex Moser. Yeah, everybody's everybody's decent. We love everybody. Just don't be nasty and try and dictate somebody else's country's politics. <laughs> That's all we ask for. Um, so no, there's there's some really lovely messages coming out. So Lenny, thanks for that. I'm glad you and others are vlogging live because the TV is so depressing. You are so right. And hopefully this will give you something nice to, to look forward to. And as I said, tomorrow uh, we are going out to, um, well, I'm not going to do anything. We've got um, Leanne who's going to be doing some yoga for you tomorrow. Um, so that will be at 6.30 p.m. our time and it will finish at 7.30 p.m. Um, so it'll be an hour long yoga session just from Scotland. Hopefully get you moving while you're in isolation. Um, you won't see me, unfortunately, but I'll see you guys back again on Wednesday um, for the chat on the 1820s martyrs and to mark another really important anniversary, 200 years. So Mark, Michael, you're very welcome. Um, I'm, I'm loving it. To be fair, I love uh, I love talking about Scotland. I love uh, talking about Scottish history and and helping to educate people um, on things that maybe they won't find um, so easily and so accessible at school and so on. Um, let's just see, Crystal, yoga with gin, perhaps. I will be doing the yoga with the gin. Actually, today I'm not drinking gin. I'm drinking a passion fruit martini. <laughs> It's actually very nice. Um, so it's been nice listening to this or the kiddos show. <laughs> I hear you. I think that's part of the problem, actually. I think I'm going a bit mad. Um, I think this is the only thing that's kind of keeping me sane with um, with three kids and a dog and, a, and another half um, living in amongst, on top of one another. But like I said, we're all doing it for the, for the right reasons. So... Do whatever you need to do to stay sane, but just know that we're all in it together and we're all needing to do this. It's really important. You're welcome, Jax. You're welcome. Um, will Leon, will Le Leon? <laughs> Sorry, Leanne. Will Leanne uh, be on the Slan Scotland page? Yes, she will. Leanne will be here tomorrow night. Um, Let's just see. And Michael, my wife and I were fortunate to experience Scotland last June, especially our trip with Slange. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, hopefully we'll be back to doing this again. Uh, back to touring. As I said before, Scotland's waiting. 
we can wait. It's waited all this time since 843 AD as an independent nation. So uh, there you go. So anyway, thank you very much, everyone. My time is going to be up in a second. So I just want to thank you all for, for taking part. And I hope I educated somewhat and, on some of the elements of Scotland and and the uh, the history leading up to the, the declaration of our growth. And we'll leave it there. So thank you all. See you all tomorrow. Slanch. Good time. Bye bye.